So this uh, work was uh, in collaboration with the past colleagues when I was working for uh, Huawei, Charles Ludovic uh, de Santos and Cédric Malherme, uh, and uh, current colleagues now that I work at INRIA, uh, Marc Lelarge and uh, my PhD student, uh, David Robin. So basically what we want to do uh, is try to better understand why neural network uh, can be trained with stochastic gradient descent. Uh, you know, all, all of you, I guess, that uh, this is like stochastic gradient descent or its variants like ADAM, etc. They, they are used in practice to train neural networks, uh, but it's a non-convex setting. And, and basically, <clears throat> as long as we move out from the convex settings, uh, theoretically, things become uh, complicated. Uh, and, and I mean, there has been a lot of uh, research in this direction. For the past uh, five years, there has been uh, like very important progress uh, from the theoretical side, uh, but there is still uh, today a gap, uh, I would say, between theory and practice. Uh, one of the reasons being that uh, th uh, like there are so many people working on deep learning in practice today that there are thousands and thousands of uh, different architectures, you know, very complicated uh, neural networks. Uh, like some practices like batch normalization, dropout, etc., that uh, you know does not exactly fit into the uh, theoretical framework. Uh, but <clears throat> so yeah, apologize for uh, not putting uh, like a list of, of uh, past uh, research on this topic. Uh, but okay, I'll just to put the time here. Uh, but there has been you know, a lot of uh, research on the theoretical side of uh, uh, this uh, problem for the past five years. As I was mentioning, for a lot of people actually in this uh, room and in this workshop, uh, including Francis uh, and, and Lena Ixiza on like, infinite uh, width <coughs> neural networks uh, and on uh, like lazy training, the overparameterized setting. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and, and yeah, today I would like to speak about uh, Wojciechowicz uh, conditions. And uh, it seems like it's, it's starting to emerge as a, a, a very reasonable uh, way to analyze uh, neural networks uh, and, and to make sense of all these different works uh, that, that uh, try to, to, to show convergence for neural networks. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> the goal of this uh, presentation is twofold. First, I will have like, a very short uh, introduction to these uh, conditions. Uh, so maybe just before I start, how many of you know about, uh, I've heard about this uh, Wojciechowicz conditions? Okay, so a so good amount of you, good. Um, <clears throat> so I, I will briefly mention this, uh, and then I will move towards uh, what can we do uh, to have like more uh, flexibility in this uh, condition in order to be more generic and hopefully uh, be more applicable in, in practical setups. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, I will just look at risk uh, minimization. So just to have the uh, terms, uh, everyone agrees on the notation. I will uh, write the loss function as a little l, the model g theta, so for the parameter uh, theta in a d-dimensional uh, vector space. And I will uh, consider that uh, g star is uh, the objective function that we are trying to uh, learn from. Okay, so your data uh, here, instead of being uh, x, y, is going to be x, uh, g star of x. Okay, I'm uh, going to, well, my, my point here basically today is to show that it's, it's actually very simple to do, uh, to, to use these uh, uh, Wojciechowicz uh, conditions in, uh, in this setting, I will show why it, why it uh, can be used uh, and how to use it, uh, but I will not touch on the difficult side of it. Uh, there is a very, very interesting works on non-smooth uh, um, optimization, like non-smooth, non-convex optimization, and, and what happens for in, in the non-smooth setting. Uh, uh, Jérôme Bolt uh, presented yesterday is some, uh, like, <clears throat> the, the, the problem, uh, at least, that arises for automatic differentiation in an smooth setting. I will not go into all these details uh, and, and technicalities, uh, so I will just focus on the smooth uh, setting. So for the loss, I will assume that it's convex and smooth. Uh, this is not a big assumption. Most uh, losses in, in practice that we use in practice are uh, convex and smooth. 
but I will also assume that the model is smooth. That is, uh, well, at least locally smooth. Uh, that is a much bigger assumption as uh, really networks don't uh, fit that, that assumption. But you can smoothen the, the ReLU function and, and obtain smoothness. Uh, in terms of notation, I will look at uh, <coughs> uh, distances uh, between uh, function. I will look at, uh, so, so I will just write the scalar product between uh, two functions as the expectation with respect to the data uh, distribution uh, of the product between these two. And because we have vector output, then just have a scalar product between the two. Uh, so I assume that everything is clear at this point. Um, <clears throat> okay, so of course, uh, when is it uh, very simple? Uh, when the, the model is linear, we have convex optimization. We know that SGD is going to converge to an optimum. Well, the, the, the function value is going to reach the, uh, its uh, zero. The, the loss is going to reach zero. Um, but in the non-convex setting, which is the, con the, the setting as soon as you have more than one layer in your networks, uh, you're going to <clears throat> uh, go into the realm of non-convex optimization. And there is a very typical workaround. Uh, in order to do basically the same thing as you were doing for convex optimization, but in this non-convex setting. Uh, this workaround is by using this uh, PL condition uh, that was proposed by uh, Wojciewicz in the 60s. Uh, so the way I write it here is a bit different from uh, what we saw uh, uh, yesterday during the three-minute presentation uh, about the same uh, topics. Uh, but basically, uh, it's, it's just the idea is to uh, uh, give a lower bound on the norm of the gradient uh, with respect to the value of the function. So the idea is to say that as long as I'm far from the uh, optimal, uh, my gradient, the gradient of my function is going to be big. Okay, and by far I mean that the function value is, is still very high, so there is a lot of optimization to be done. Um, <clears throat> so how do you use this in practice? Actually, it's extremely easy, so I want to convince you that this is very simple. So I'm just going to look so far at uh, like simple gradient descent. So if you have a smooth function, uh, this is basically the definition for a smooth function. Well, uh, and and <clears throat> this is just upper bounding by a quadratic function. Uh, if you replace the uh, value of the uh, next iterate with its uh, value for gradient descent, you obtain uh, a bound that depends on the norm of the gradient, and this is exactly why uh, this works. Uh, see, it's a three-line uh, proof, basically, uh, where you replace the norm of the gradient by a square root of the, the value of the function. You obtain a recurrence uh, a relationship, uh, and you can integrate this and get uh, exponential uh, decrease. Okay, so it's as simple as that, of course, that is the most basic setting where you have gradient descent, you don't have stochasticity, uh, you have smoothness, so like the perfect uh, ideal setting. Um, <clears throat> now, if you want to make things a bit more complicated, you, would, you can still do it with uh, stochasticity. So here, stochasticity, I will, I will uh, define it by having, instead of having the exact gradient, I have a, a noise term <coughs> here. Uh, for the gradient, I assume that the expectation of the noise is equal to zero and the variance is bounded. Uh, so if you do this, uh, basically the only thing that you need to do is just taking the expectation of your uh, decrease uh, at, at, um, like, uh, at each iteration. Uh, and everything is going to work in the same way. You have a, a term here that is equal to zero because of the expectation of the noise being equal to zero. Uh, and you end up with uh, a second term here that is going to depend on the variance of the noise, okay? Now, the important thing is that you have an eta square here uh, instead of uh, an, an, an eta here. So uh, when, when you compute, like when you uh, solve the recurrence equation, uh, relationship uh, for, for this, uh, new, um, this new equation, what you get is, uh, again, an exponential decrease but then this noise term can be, um, can be reduced by selecting uh, a step size eta that tends to zero. Okay, so that's a very, very standard analysis. Uh, you get uh, uh, convergence rates which, uh, which are of the order of 1 over t uh, modulo uh, 
having more or less log over t, you have a log t here. Uh, I guess if you're a bit more clever in the analysis, you can, we can remove it. Uh, but I'm not going to be clever in this presentation. I'm just going to do like simple analysis. Okay, so that's basically the gist of it. So SGD is going to converge exactly the same type of analysis that you would do for convex optimization. Now the question is, okay, this, the, does this does neural network in practice uh, verify this uh, PL assumption? Okay. Uh, and <clears throat> so what you can do is uh, compute the norm of the gradient of the function. You're going to end up with, so this term, uh, I, um, I write the Jacobian of the model with respect to the parameter this way. So this is just a notation for the Jacobian. Uh, and, and you end up, well, the chain rule gives you this uh, Jacobian product, uh, well, transpose times the uh, gradient with respect to the first, um, the first uh, term, the first coordinate of the loss function, okay? Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to rewrite this uh, by uh, basically expanding the, the square norm as a scalar product uh, between uh, twice the same term. And I'm going to introduce two uh, independent uh, random variables that are both drawn according to the data distribution. Uh, in order to uh, make this uh, bilinear uh, form appear, now, the reason why I want this bilinear form to appear, this uh, kappa theta, is that this is, has been extensively studied in the uh, uh, literature uh, and it's called the uh, neural tangent kernel. So it was proposed by Jaco and his uh, co-authors uh, in 2018. Um, <clears throat> and now you have a bilinear form. So uh, if you think about the setting where uh, you only care about training uh, accuracy, so you want to your, your expectation here is over a finite set of training examples, then this bilinear form is just a quadratic form uh, of the type like X transpose MX, where M is a big matrix, very big matrix. Uh, and so what is very reasonable is if you want to uh, lower bound this quantity, well, what you can do is, is transform it into a product of two terms. The first one being, well, the smallest eigenvalue in the, in the finite setting. Here you, have a, you would have an infimum of these, uh, this uh, quantity uh, of the, the bilinear form for f and f uh, times, well, the norm of the, the vector, right? Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention, this is just a notation for the function that at x gives uh, this quantity, the gradient of uh, the loss for the output of the model uh, and the... Uh, output of the uh, target function, okay? Okay, so in, you end up with this product of two terms, and then the, uh, the game is to try to uh, lower bound these two terms uh, separately. So how do you do this? Well, for the first term, uh, basically you're going to look at the spectrum, as I was mentioning, of the uh, NTK, and you can show that for, uh, in a number of settings, is going to be controlled uh, at initialization, okay? So once you, when you initialize the neural network with this uh, random initialization, you will have uh, uh, it, it going to behave uh, relatively well, and you can prove that uh, basically the, 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 uh, the spectrum is lower bounded uh, at initialization, and then this, this uh, uh, lower bound is going to be also valid in the neighborhood around initialization. Now you can't hope for, have, for having this uh, inequality hold for the whole space uh, because then you would, I mean, basically you, yeah, if, if this holds for the whole space, then it means that you don't have any, uh, any saddle points uh, to, to your objective function. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so, so. Uh, yeah, so, so you can still show that uh, for a sufficiently, for a reasonably large uh, radius around initialization, you will still have the condition that will hold. And this is due to the fact that as the number of neurons tend to infinity, the uh, NTK is going to be uh, nearly constant uh, around initialization. Basically, second order derivative is going to uh, tend to zero. Uh, now for the second aspect, so this is a, a condition that uh, uh, is uh, called uh, by, by uh, Liu, um, uh, 
I think it's Liu Ji and, and uh, Belkin, Michael Belkin, that will present also later this, uh, this, will, this week, uh, that proposed this uh, notion of uniform conditioning. Uh, that basically, uh, uh, well, describes this notion, this, this, uh, what, what I just mentioned, uh, that you have uh, a control on the spectrum of the NTK in a, in a neighborhood around initialization. Uh, okay, now for the second term. Well, the second term is actually much easier because, uh, as I was saying, basically the loss function is usually very, very nice, very simple. Uh, it behaves very well, and you can show uh, PL type uh, uh, inequality, for example, for mean square error, uh, for uh, so for for the losses that we use in practice. Uh, that is going to control the norm of the gradient of the loss. So if you just plug a PL inequality in this uh, equation, then I well, have the expectation of new times the, uh, the, the loss function. And so this is just going to, be, to give you the, um, uh, this, this uh, multiplicative term mu times the uh, objective function. Okay, so you end up with exactly what you wanted, which is that you have a lower bound on the norm of the gradient that depends on well, there is a square root of some uh, quantity times the objective function. Uh, now, the catch is that you only have it on a neighborhood around initialization, so you need to be extra careful that you don't go too far during your uh, optimization. Now, uh, I'm not going to do, go into these details, but uh, basically, I mean, you can show that if uh, R is sufficiently big, then you will have convergence to the, the uh, global optimum of the function. Uh, which is zero for, for our risk minimization problem uh, with, uh, yeah, with, uh, with this uh, assumption. Okay, so that was for the introduction of this uh, PL condition. Now, what are the issues? I mean, how far are we from, from actually using this in practice? And I would say there are two uh, big issues. The first one is that this, the, as I was mentioning, for MSC, the loss it verifies the PL condition. Actually, if you look at other losses, for example, cross entropy, which is like, arguably the most important loss for uh, multi-class classification, uh, you don't have a, a PL condition, but you have something very similar, uh, which is uh, an extension of it. It's, it's also a Wojciewicz uh, condition, but there is no uh, dependency. I mean, the dependency is not in square root, okay? So how do you deal with this, uh, these uh, types of uh, uh, Wojciewicz conditions? And the second issue, which is maybe more uh, important, is that uh, this, this bilinear, I mean, this bilinear form, the, the, the kappa uh, tilde, uh, may not be a positive definite even at initialization. So, well, to put it simply, if this, this uh, term is equal to zero, then you have vacuous bound and you, you cannot prove, of course, uh, anything. Uh, why is it the case? Well, <clears throat> one of the settings uh, where it, it is the case is in the underparameterized uh, regime where you have uh, less parameters than the number of data points. Uh, basically, if you think about it as uh, this, so as I was mentioning, mentioning this in the, uh, in the finite setting where you have a finite, finite number of uh, training samples, uh, this is a big matrix uh, and it has more like rows than, than columns or the other way around. Well, <clears throat> basically you end up with uh, necessarily uh, uh, some, some uh, values, some uh, uh, eigenvalues that are equal to zero. Uh, so this is the case in the underparameter setting. It's even more the case when you're looking at data distributions that are continuous. So uh, you're in a non-line setting and you try to uh, so you observe uh, data points uh, that are drawn with respect to a continuous distribution, and uh, you, you try to minimize this expectation over the continuous uh, distribution. So how do you do uh, in such a setting? Uh, so we are going to propose two solutions, basically. Uh, so this is what we uh, did with uh, my co uh, collaborators. Uh, the first solution is to uh, use the uh, kurdika wojciewicz uh, condition instead of uh, poliak wojciewicz uh, This is not a very big uh, issue, as you will see. Uh, basically, you need to be a bit more careful uh, when, when you do the, the analysis, but in the smooth setting, it, it remains uh, relatively simple. Uh, <clears throat> the second uh, thing, so how are we going to 
solve this issue is by going one step uh, back and instead of looking at the spectrum, the whole spectrum of this bilinear form, we're just going to look at the Rayleigh quotient, uh, which is uh, basically the, the, the bilinear form looked at. Uh, so we're just going one step back basically in this, in this uh, uh, inequality and looking at this quantity itself and hoping that there is sufficient information on uh, this, uh, this term, this function, so that we can uh, better, bound, uh, the, uh, better bound the norm of the gradient. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to show you what, uh, what happens. One, one of the things that you can do with it, of course it's not the only uh, solution to it. But, uh, so one of the things that you can do is uh, rewrite, so as I was mentioning, so yeah, I'm going to, in this case, setting, I'm going to look at uh, specifically the mean square error loss. So I'm going to look at a simpler setting that I was uh, presenting before, uh, but you will see that there is a nice interpre interpretation to it. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the norm of the gradient, you will rewrite it as uh, this way. I mean, you just have replaced the gradient of the loss by, by its, uh, its value. Uh, and the, the, the trick here is to replace the norm uh, of, of this uh, vector by a supremum over all uh, vectors of the scalar product between the, the vector and this, uh, this, um, the, any vector that is a unit norm. Okay, so that is just a trick that allows us to uh, take the expectation, put it outside of the scalar product, and get a quantity that is uh, that has a lot of meaning. If you if you think about it, it's just going to be basically I'm I'm asking the question: Can you uh, using your gradient, can I uh, go in the direction uh, where I want to go, which is uh, going towards the um, the G star, so the, the target function from where, where I am at currently, which is uh, G theta, okay? So my current model, the, the target function, and I want to make sure that basically there is a decent, a decent direction that uh, goes uh, towards the, in, in the right direction. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> now I'm still going to rewrite this a little bit uh, further. Uh, I rewrite the scalar product. First of all, the, the supremum, I'm just going to divide by the norm of V uh, here, and I'm going to replace the scalar product by uh, norm of uh, this plus norm of this minus the uh, norm of A plus B. Uh, there is a sign that uh, we don't really care about because uh, you can always put it in the, in the V here. Okay, so you end up with this uh, quantity, a supremum over all uh, vectors V. <coughs> Uh, of here you recognize the loss function, so that's very good. We want to have lower bounds that depends on the, on the loss function. You have a term that is positive here, so we will just uh, uh, remove it from the inequality. And then what you see here is something that is uh, um, very interesting, that is a difference between, so if you rewrite it, you have g theta plus the um, plus the Jacobian times this uh, vector minus uh, G star. So you're comparing basically a first order approximation uh, around uh, theta with the actual uh, target function, okay? Uh, and <clears throat> in a sense, having, uh, making sure that this quantity uh, can be small for uh, um, uh, some, diff some uh, fixed uh, V, uh, is very similar to the universal uh, approximation theorems that uh, uh, we used to, where you're trying to show that there is a theta that uh, such that the, the distance between g theta, so your uh, model, and the target function is, is small. So I will speak a little bit about this in the next slide. But just to, to give you an idea, so you end up with a function here. If you can show that this quantity is bounded by uh, uh, epsilon, by a small quantity, then you end up with a uh, KL condition, where now your function, instead of being square root of, uh, the, of, of uh, x, well, mu times x, you have something that is linear here, so you have uh, uh, mu, so a, a multiplicative factor that depends on the norm of this vector, and you have a linear term, well, uh, a fine term, that is x minus this uh, epsilon quantity. So then, if you know how to deal with this uh, KL condition, with this SGD, 
then you will be able to use uh, this uh, this uh, upper bound, uh, this uh, lower bound, sorry, and to prove convergence. So that's basically the, the gist of it. Uh, so this is why, uh, as, I, as I was saying uh, before, there is a strong connection with the notion of universal approximation that was introduced in the 80s and 90s. Uh, uh, I mean, there are lots of different works that, that do this, but one of those is uh, Siben uh, the, the work of Sibenko in 89. Basically, it showed that <clears throat> for two-layer uh, neural networks, you can always find a number of uh, neurons and a... Uh, uh, certain parameter theta star such that the distance uh, in infinite norm uh, between the model and the uh, uh, target function is uh, lower is uh, upper bounded sorry by epsilon so this is this picture you start maybe you're at uh, g theta here uh, but you know that there is a parameter here g theta star uh, well a set of parameters such that the model is is close to the uh, to the target function okay uh, but, but of course, this type of analysis, I mean, it's very interesting to know like how expressive are neural networks uh, if they can, in theory, approximate uh, any uh, continuous function. But in practice, it's not very useful, uh, right? Because this, uh, well, you, you have no idea if you can uh, reach this uh, theta star uh, with uh, stochastic, well, with gradient descent. So basically what we show is something uh, a, a little uh, different. Uh, it's uh, what I was mentioning before is that basically uh, if, if you start at uh, G theta and you look at the uh, basically first order approximation starting from, from uh, theta, you're going to find uh, some, some functions that are uh, close within any precision of, of the target function. Okay. <clears throat> Now it becomes a bit complicated to state because, well, you want to show this in a ball around initialization, but the initialization is itself um, uh, random uh, So for, for neural networks. So there is a, a definition with high probability. So if, if you fix epsilon, delta, and r, uh, so epsilon being the uh, required precision, the, the precision that you want to reach, uh, De delta is the probability uh, of, of error and r is the radius uh, of the ball uh, here, the ball, well, I didn't write the, the, the ball actually here, but uh, the ball around initialization on which you want this uh, uh, characteristic to be verified. <clears throat> then there exists always a, a number of neurons such that with probability one minus delta on this ball around initialization, there is always basically a, a descent direction in a way, such that the, the first order, well, the first order approximation is going to be uh, a good approximation of, of the target function, okay? Now, there is an additional assumption here. Basically, as I was mentioning before, the norm of the, 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 the vector is going to play a role in the uh, convergence rate. So I need to ensure that this remains small. And what we are able to do is to bound this, the norm of this uh, uh, term of this uh, vector by uh, the norm of the, the distance to initialization uh, plus a constant that depends only on epsilon uh, and delta and uh, g star, okay? Uh, yeah, so how do we do this just uh, very, okay, very quickly? Uh, how do we do this? We're just going to select uh, a very re a reasonable uh, v uh, and show that for this v, you have uh, you you're, you can actually approximate well the target function. Um, <clears throat> so we we do this in a, like the most simple way you can think of. We're just going to look at the derivative with respect to the second layer, so just the uh, linear layer. Uh, and in this case, so I take v that is equal to zero on the uh, first layer. You have a very simple formula. Basically, you're you're able to uh, change the, the, the value of the first uh, layer. Okay, so that, that's basically it. So you can just show that if you select this uh, A prime uh, nicely, you can recover, you can recreate your, um, your uh, target, um, your, your target uh, function. Okay, I will not go into more uh, details on this uh, because otherwise I won't have time to, to speak about the rest. Um, 
But basically, what do you end up with? You end up with a lower bound on the norm of the gradient that is a product of two terms. Okay, again, this term is relatively simple. As I was mentioning, there is a linear, well, a fine uh, term. Uh, the, the, there is this uh, epsilon, which is the uh, approximation that uh, on, on, the, uh, on the target function. But you also have a uh, term here that depends on the distance to initialization. So compared to uh, like the KL star uh, setting and PL star setting um, <clears throat> that, that, that I was mentioning before, uh, in, in, in the other settings you just had, uh, in a way you just had this indication, uh, indicator uh, function, this step function, uh, ensuring that the only thing that you, you, you can only speak about uh, points that are within a uh, ball of radius R from initialization. So now you have also this extra term. Okay, so the question is, uh, well, it's a bit more complicated, but can we do the same thing, uh, basically, as we were doing with the PLs, uh, PL and KL? Okay, so that's what we propose. Basically, we show that uh, this, for this generalization of, of uh, Wojciewicz uh, conditions, you can still obtain convergence for uh, SGD. So here we have uh, a function that depends uh, on the uh, distance to initialization, and here a function that depends uh, on the decrease from, from the uh, original, from the initialization, uh, well, the, f the, the value of the objective function at initialization. Uh, the reason why I write it this way and not in terms of f theta uh, is just because then the, the, the two functions have a similar role in a sense that they are both. Uh, uh, positive and, and uh, non-increasing. Uh, non Sorry. So as these two quantities uh, increase, uh, I will have the bound that is uh, more and more vacuous, uh, tending to zero, and, and I will say less and less uh, interesting things about the, the, the convergence, basically, of F. Uh, so this is a generalization to PL star and KL star in the sense that uh, as I was mentioning, if you, if you take this uh, function, uh, psi, as a step function, you recover the bounds of the, of the type uh, if uh, theta is within this ball of radius r uh, to initialization, then I have this uh, square root uh, lower bound on the gradient. And the KL star uh, can be uh, recovered by just taking a function, uh, any function phi that is uh, uh, non-decreasing uh, this time for this one. Okay. Okay. So how do we deal with this? Uh, how how much time do I have? You have until forty-five. Okay. Okay. Ten minutes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so now, if I do the same trick as I was doing before, uh, basically I end up with the same uh, analysis, three-line analysis. I have the norm of the gradient here of the function, and I replace it by this product of two terms. Now you see that we're going to have uh, at least one issue, which is that you have an expectation of a product, uh, and it's not uh, simple to put the expectation inside. So unfortunately, like you need additional assumptions, uh, at least if you wanted to take the expectation inside, like do a Jensen basically, and take the expectation inside the, the, the function phi. But there is another issue, which is that uh, you have this dependency in the distance to initialization, so you need to find a way to remove this dependency, okay? So how do you do this? Well, basically you need to find a bound on the distance to initialization with respect to the function, to the value of the function. So for simplicity here, I will go back to gradient descent, so a noise term that is equal to zero. Uh, but the same thing can be done basically for stochastic gradient descent. You just have a more uh, messy, like you have noise term that appear. Uh, everywhere, but basically the, the, the idea stayed the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, write an inequality between the function value and the distances uh, by using this uh, separable, the, the fact that the, 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 the lower bound is separable. So it's a, it's a product of two terms. So basically I'm, uh, I'm using, first of all, the, 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 the uh, increment, well, the, the, yeah, the, the, the decrease at each iteration is going to be bounded by the norm of the gradient. This is, well, this is uh, this uh, this uh, step in the proof. 
Uh, and I'm going to replace this by uh, this uh, dt, that is the sum, well, eta, the, the step size times the sum of the norm of the gradient, which is uh, uh, quite straightforwardly uh, uh, an upper bound on the distance. Okay, so I'm going to replace this norm by a product of the two norms. So I take one of the, the, the norms and I replace it by di plus one minus di, and I keep one of the norms uh, here. Okay? Uh, and, and then uh, what I do basically is that uh, I'm going to uh, replace this norm of the uh, gradient by, by uh, psi of, uh, of di. So, so if, I, if I remember, I, I mean, if I replace this by the product of, uh, <coughs> of phi fi times uh, psi di, the, the two terms are going to uh, simplify and you just end up with uh, psi of the, the, this uh, well, distance, well, in a way, it's the distance traveled by the uh, optimization uh, uh, iterates. Okay, so now I just have uh, two, um, uh, two terms. I'm just going to integrate on both sides. So I just sum, and the Riemann, you have a Riemann sum that I'm going to bound by the integral. So you end up with a, you end up with a bound between two integrals. Uh, that is going to give you with this uh, slightly ugly notation, but it's so that I can write what is the uh, pseudo inverse of this uh, the, the the integral. Uh, you can you end up you can end up with a bound on the distance to initialization with respect to the uh, decrease in function value. Okay, so at this point you have uh, what you wanted, what you needed. So uh, you can replace this uh, <coughs> this term by uh, this, this function of uh, fi. So you end up with uh, what I will call uh, chi uh, of, of ft, which is this uh, ugly function here. Uh, but basically you keep the same behavior, which is uh, a product of two terms. The first term is what would happen if you didn't have dependency in the, in the distance. Uh, and the second term is to account for uh, the distance, the fact that as you converge, uh, you go further away from uh, initialization, and so your bound on the gradient is going to become smaller and smaller. Okay, so we integrate this, we get uh, um, uh, an upper bound on the iterates. Uh, and uh, well, you can check that you, you obtain, like in simple cases, when, when psi is equal to one, you, you get a convergence rate, which is uh, just by taking the, the, the <coughs> As I was mentioning, chi is going to be equal to one over uh, phi square. So you can recover like uh, exponential uh, convergence rate uh, in, the, in the PL setting and, and in the KL, like the linear setting where, where uh, phi is, uh, is linear, you will have a convergence rate in one over T. Uh, and in the KL, uh, at the KL star condition can be uh, uh, obtained um, well, yeah, the, the, so the, the general KL star condition is, is obtained with phi equal to uh, uh, this, this uh, other little curvy phi of uh, f theta zero minus x. And you end up with, uh, with um, uh, low, uh, an upper bound that is more easy to digest. Basically, it's a maximum of two terms, so you have to see it uh, this way you have, uh, this gives you the convergence rate, uh, and this gives you where the convergence stops. So basically at some point you reach the end of your uh, 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 knowledge, I mean domain where you have knowledge on the gradient, uh, and so you actually stop convergence. Okay, now, now uh, this was for gradient descent. How you do you deal with stochasticity? Well, basically in order not to deal with this expectation of products, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the noise is a sub-Gaussian, uh, and I'm going to do everything in, uh, with high probability. Uh, so that's one, uh, one way to deal with it. Uh, so because we have sub-Gaussian noise, basically you can, we, we can use union bounds and the uh, uh, noise terms are not going to be uh, too, too, uh, too annoying. <clears throat> so this is like the, the, the final result. Uh, you see that compared to the gradient descent setting, you have here an, uh, an additive uh, noise term that depends here, that depends on square root log one over delta. This is because you have sub-Gaussian uh, types of uh, upper bound. 
Uh, and if you choose uh, eta wisely, so you see here that uh, you have a dependency on eta square root of t. So you typically want to choose eta that uh, decrease faster than one over square root t. Okay, so that's basically that's uh, yeah very standard uh, um, uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent analysis. Uh, except that now it's in a more generic setting uh, with this uh, this uh, SL star uh, condition. Okay, so. I uh, arrived at the end of the presentation. It's nearly 45, so that's, that's nice. Uh, uh, so basically, if we plug in now this SL star with the uh, upper bound, that, with the lower bound that we had on the norm of the gradient, so in the uh, practical setting, like two-layer neural network, you get a convergence of SGD to any given uh, test precision uh, in an online setting. So it's again, I was saying, uh, ideally, we would like to you know, extend the, the, the reach of this, these types of uh, analy analysis, like wide Chebyshev conditions, to a bigger set of uh, neural networks and, and loss function. So yeah, we, we're still you know, uh, working on this. <laughs> uh, we still have only two layer neural networks. Uh, but at least we can uh, think of the, the, uh, the, uh, approx well, the, the objective, uh, the error uh, for, for the test, uh, so basically for continuous distribution, data distributions. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope I convinced you that using this Wierczewicz conditions is, is fairly easy, uh, as long as you're in the smooth setting, uh, again. Uh, and if you, if you go back one step, basically, instead of looking at the NTK, looking at the Rayleigh quotients, uh, I haven't uh, described it here, but I have several other uh, uh, scenarios where you can actually prove uh, uh, more uh, finer bounds than, than just looking at the spectrum uh, in other settings using this uh, Rayleigh quotient. So everything is in these uh, uh, two papers. Uh, so yeah, if you want more detail, feel free to, to have a look. And that's it for me. Can you go back to the SL star? Just one, one, one question about yeah. SL star. I think, I'm, I think I might be just a bit confused. Uh, uh, there. So theta zero is the initial point, you're saying? Yep. So what happens if theta approximates any stationary point of the gradient? So if, if sorry? So if, if theta yeah. is at any stationary point of the gradient, you have zero is greater or equal yep. than these functions yeah, that yeah. are the difference so, between a stationary yeah. point at theta zero. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's exactly why you need uh, uh, another term. So uh, basically, this can only hold uh, on the whole space if you have a term here that is going to vanish as you move uh, further away from, from the initialization. So basically, if you have such a bound, it means that uh, close to the initialization, you don't have uh, saddle points, yeah, stationary points. OK. And why not just work with, uh, you know, just like, KL, instead of having theta zeros, having theta stars, like a sort of KL and then doing yeah, the Yeah, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, it's just a, a, a trick of um, changing the, I mean, rewriting the notation. You can, you can have the same thing. Uh, having, uh, so, so using like a KL, uh, so F theta instead of F theta zero minus F theta, uh, you, you're going to have the same type of, uh, of uh, like lower, lower bounds, I mean, you can, you can do exactly the same thing. Uh, it's just that it's a bit easier to uh, work with this formulation because, uh, because here uh, psi and uh, phi are going to be both uh, decreasing, well, non-increasing. Uh, non so they have the same, uh, the same role. Uh, a second reason is that actually this thing is a bit more generic. I mean, you, you can prove that you converge, like that you decrease even if you don't know what is the uh, the the uh, optimal value, right? If you don't know that the optimal value is is uh, f, f theta star equals zero, uh, you you just have a bound that depends on initialization. Uh, then you can still show that you're going to decrease to, uh, well, to a certain. Uh, but but my my question about that's assuming that uh, theta, f of theta star is zero, but just having f of theta star, and you can you can do a proof for, for sort of. Yeah, I mean. 
Yeah, so if you replace uh, this, this quantity with just uh, a phi of f theta, that's, that's the same. It's just that it gives a role to uh, zero. I mean, intuitively, it gives a role to zero that, that is not necessary. You don't need to have uh, a loss function that is equal to sure, zero. Sure, I, I agree with that, actually. I'm, but, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's just I'll, I'll rewrite, rewriting, basically. Maybe we'll talk late, more later. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you go to slide 16? Yeah. So here you have uh, at the fourth point, you have an integral of 1 so, over phi. Uh, and yeah. so why is this uh, integrable? Is this part of the assumption? It could be uh, infinity. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It could be, it could be infinity. Because uh, all these things yeah, yeah. are, are going you, to zero. Yeah, yeah. yeah and which it, brings us back uh, to what is KL. The phi is mm -hmm. acting on f. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so usually, uh, yes. The 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 notation. For so KL with what is, you call Poliak Koyazevich, which should be called quadratic Koyazevich, uh -huh. you have a square root. Yeah. And so you have a Riemann yeah. integral. Yeah, so, so, so indeed, uh, this, this bound can, can be vacuous, can be infinity, uh, and, and in this case, you wouldn't gain any information. Uh, with, no, but with my point is that with KL, this, this yeah. bound is not infinity because this is integrable. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. One last question. Um, to obtain your final result about the global convergence gradient descent for two, neuro, two uh, layer neural networks, do you need a specific initialization scheme, or does it work with like general? Uh, no, no, it's a specific initialization scheme. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the usual one where you take a one over like a, a well, it's for a Gaussian uh, initialization on the weights where you take a variance which is one over square root of the dimension of the input. Okay, so standard thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay.